Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar on how blended, braided, or sequenced funding can help drive employment outcomes, equity, and inclusion. Uh, my name is Vince Kohler, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the LEAD Center, the Center for the Leadership for the Employment and, uh, and Economic Advancement of People with Disabilities. We're a WIOA Policy Development Center for the Office of Disability Employment Policy. The LEAD Center is operated in collaboration between Social Policy Research Associates and the National Disability Institute. Together, we support ODEP in facilitating the adoption and integration of inclusive WIOA programs, policies, and practices through research, technical assistance, and demonstration projects. We're delighted that you've joined us today for a webinar where you'll get some real life examples from a range of states and localities. We have a full house today with, with close to a thousand attendees. But be before we go further, let's conduct some brief housekeeping. If we can go to the next slide, please. To ensure everyone can participate fully in today's webinar, we'd like to take a moment to share some captioning and housekeeping tips. Today's webinar is live captioned and the captions appear below the slide deck. You also have the option to open the captioning webpage in a new browser and the links have been posted in the chat or will be momentarily by one of my excellent colleagues working behind the scenes. Once the captioning window opens on your system, you can adjust the background color, the color, the text color, the fonts using the drop down menu at the top of the browser window. We suggest you position the window to sit right on top of the embedded captioning to allow you to see the screen itself, as well as the captions at the same time. Next slide, please. We really encourage you to take, to ask any questions that you might have about the content we cover today. At any point, you can click the Q&A button that's located on the webinar's main uh, menu bar, and this will bring up a Q&A panel or a window into which you can type questions for our presenters. We'll save time at the end for questions and answers. If you're experiencing any technical issues or have questions for the technical support team, click the raise hand button that's on the menu bar and we'll respond to you directly. And next slide, please. And to kick off our day today, I'd like to say hello to Assistant Secretary of Labor for Disability Employment Policy, at the US Department of Labor, Ms. Taryn Williams. Ms. Williams advises the Secretary of Labor on how the department's policies and programs impact the employment of people with disabilities and leads the Office of Disability Employment Policy, ODEP. Ms. Williams. Thank you for that introduction and good afternoon, everyone. It is such a pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. Uh, as you heard, my name is Taryn Williams and I'm the Assistant Secretary of Labor for Disability Employment at the Department of Labor and head of the Office of Disability Employment Policy or ODEP for short. For those of you who are not familiar with ODEP, we are a sub cabinet agency within the Department of Labor and report directly to the secretary. Congress established ODEP 20 years ago to create a federal agency dedicated to working across policies, programs, and agencies to promote disability employment. ODEP's mission to promote employment opportunities for people with disabilities is one that I care about deeply, and that's been a defining commitment in my career. I want to thank the LEAD Center for their collaboration and all of our agency partners in their interagency work group on disability employment and specifically our subcommittee focus on blending, braiding, and sequencing for their help in putting this webinar together. It has been an exceptional team effort. Today, we will hear from experts and state and local officials who have also worked across their systems, blending, braiding, and sequencing funding and other resources to provide services to job seekers with significant disabilities and multiple barriers to employment. 
as you all know, due to limited resources, it is difficult for a single agency to provide the full range of services that meets all the needs of job seekers with significant disabilities. Blending, braiding, and sequencing strategies can help expand the range of services available to people with disabilities by sharing resources between agencies in a way that maximizes effective use of government funds, supports, and services to improve outcomes for the individual with a disability. Under this administration, one of ODEP's major priorities is to increase competitive integrated employment for individuals with disabilities. The use of blending, braiding, and sequencing across workforce and other systems can help achieve this goal. And we encourage its utilization at all levels of government. The goal of today's webinar is to show you the potential value of blending, braiding, and sequencing through our expert state and local panels. I look forward to hearing about the work our state and local partners are doing to expand access to critical services that support people with disabilities. Thank you again for joining us today. And with that, I'll hand it back to Vince who will get us started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Williams. And, um, and speaking of experts, we are fortunate today to have Dr. Lisa Mills as our tour guide through a topic that, while on the surface can appear dry and technical, is so important and fundamental to a seamless experience of support. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Lisa has written and presented on the topic and will provide a brief level setting introduction and will then moderate the panels of state and local practitioners who have done the work of blending and braiding and sequencing on the ground and live to tell about it. Lisa is a consultant at Moving to a Different Drum uh, and has worked for 30 years in the field of disabilities in both the US and the UK. She also served as a lead subject matter expert for the US DOL's Advisory Committee on Competitive Integrated Employment of Individuals with Disabilities during its first year of deliberations. Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vince, and hello, everybody. Uh, I am very happy to be here today and excited about the panels you will hear from. Uh, next slide. For now, I'd just like to start with a brief preview of the panels that are coming your way after I give you uh, an overview to start us off. Uh, you'll be hearing from the state of Colorado around its partnerships to support competitive employment. We'll then swing over to the East Coast to hear from North Carolina on its uh, state agency partnerships to support individuals with severe and persistent mental illness. And then we'll swing all the way back to the Southwest to hear about a local example uh, involving the Sonoran Center for Excellence in Disabilities uh, and a local school district and, and a success story that we'll, we'll save for the end as a surprise. Next slide. So my job is to present the learning objectives and to uh, present the concepts of blending, braiding, and sequencing uh, and help uh, un everyone understand how these concepts differ. Uh, we'd also uh, hope that everyone, while we're sure everyone's aware of the national workforce shortage, to look for the silver lining in that and see new opportunities that this creates for employers to tap the talents of people with disabilities who are not yet in the general workforce. Uh, we'll share, as, as I mentioned, state and local examples of successful coordination of resources from around the country. And uh, we really hope that everyone recognizes that uh, the process of coordinating resources uh, is both necessary and um, it creates a lot of benefits uh, when we're trying to assist individuals with disabilities to achieve competitive integrated employment and they are eligible for supports from multiple systems. Next slide. 
So I want to talk about sequencing first, and I'm uh, talking about it first because sequencing is really a very foundational practice in terms of coordinating resources between funders. Uh, this is probably the most common practice in the country and has been around for a while. Uh, sequencing occurs essentially when multiple funding streams separately serve a person with a disability, but they do that sequentially. Uh, in, in this slide, there's a visual to help explain uh, uh, three arrows that are consecutive, uh, representing different funding streams, uh, handing off responsibility to provide services and supports to a person with a disability. There's a cartoon cloud that says, think relay race. So in sequencing, it, uh, it is similar to a relay race in that funders um, really serve people in, uh, and then hand off the responsibility to continue to serve to another funder. And then oftentimes people may uh, be handed off yet again as they work through their process of uh, achieving and maintaining employment. This does require collaboration and coordination, especially to ensure there are no gaps in necessary services as these handoffs occur. Uh, next slide. So sequencing has been a, a great uh, formative practice, something that that uh, when uh, very early on wanted, where funders wanted to coordinate resources, they, they typically use this practice first, but we have learned that there are better options uh, that, that take us further and help us do better than sequencing. Uh, so we're going to talk about braiding and blending as kind of steps up from sequencing in terms of uh, enabling funders to provide more effective services um, to ensure continuity in service delivery for, for individuals they are serving, and actually, most importantly, to increase successful outcomes and equity and inclusion. Uh, going beyond sequencing also allows for providing a, a more, more holistic supports, um, particularly for individuals with disabilities who have more significant support needs and need uh, more intense, a sufficient intensity of service to succeed in competitive integrated employment. Uh, so we uh, believe through experience that people can advance to uh, obtain competitive integrated employment and keep that, they can reach their goals more quickly if we can actually do something beyond sequencing and uh, provide services simultaneously. Next slide. So I wanna talk to you about braiding. And in this slide, there's a visual. It's three overlapping arrows, three arrows that are moving along together. Uh, representing three, the potential for three different funding sources to actually um, uh, braid services, which means that at, they provide services separately, but simultaneously. So at the same time, they are each providing services to an individual with a disability. Um, so there's a little cartoon cloud here that says, think team sport. So uh, unlike the relay race where you're handing off and only one funder is working with a person at a time, in braiding, multiple funders are working with the same individual together. Um, this certainly requires collaboration and coordination uh, because we don't want to duplicate what each funder is providing, but uh, it absolutely provides the ability to more effectively serve a person and uh, where necessary for people who need more service to provide more robust supports to a person so they can achieve competitive employment. Next slide. Braiding um, actually requires enhanced collaboration, but the, the, the the silver lining for braiding is that it generates better outcomes at less cost to each of the funding sources because we are you are sharing the costs uh, rather than expecting one system or another to do everything. Uh, it requires more teamwork and communication because it's not just about a handoff as in the, as in with sequencing, uh, coordinating the services that are occurring simultaneously ensuring non-duplication 
And really each funder has a plan that that now reflects the other funders participation in uh, the person's overall plan to reach their goal. Uh, so we focus in braiding on cost sharing rather than cost shifting, which I think is a fundamental principle um, around this type of collaboration. Uh, we focus on division of payment responsibility, that is defining what each funder can provide both in the short and the long term. And particularly if multiple funders can pay for the same thing, uh, braiding requires a really clear agreement about who will pay when. Next slide. The last concept I want to introduce is blending, and uh, blending is a, a step beyond braiding. And in this slide, I have a visual illustration that is a funnel uh, with three blue bubbles in it, representing multiple funders participating around a single individual with a disability. What happens with blending is something like uh, baking a cake. Uh, all three funders put their money into the funnel and uh, out the bottom of the funnel comes a single budget, a single pot of money for an individual with a disability to have a single plan to reach their employment goal. Now, obviously, blending is the simplest, most seamless way to share, uh, to cost share around a common customer. Um, the, the issue we are still working on and figuring out is how does each funder able to account for their dollars that go into the funnel or go into the cake? Um, once all the funds are pooled in a single budget, it can be difficult for a funding source to keep track of where its money went. And so typically at this point, blending still requires an explicit authorization through statute or regulation. But I do want to show you a couple of examples of blending that's already occurring. Um, and, and we believe as, as we move on that we will be able to figure out how to move to this um, optimal approach. Next slide. So the two examples of blending that we already know exist and, and, are, and are working is uh, sometimes state agencies have state general fund dollars, and one agency will uh, transfer its general fund dollars to a second agency through an interagency transfer agreement. Um, that will allow the second agency to use those dollars to capture more federal match for their employment services and support programs. Um, that second agency then turns around and has the capacity to provide services to the first agency's population. So that's an example of blending that is working in many states. Another example is ticket to work. When an agency earns ticket to work outcome or milestone payments, uh, once they uh, obviously account for the cost of delivering the services that allowed them to earn those payments, the net income they have left they are able to pool with other funding uh, streams they have to create a more robust uh, funding stream to provide services and oftentimes enhance services to people they serve. So that's those are two examples of blending in practice. Um, I now wanna move on to introduce our first panel. Next slide. From the state of Colorado, I'm pleased to present uh, and introduce Megan Green. Uh, she is the Competitive Integrated Employment Manager for the Colorado Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. I'd like to also introduce Katie Talerto, who is from the Office of Community Living at the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, the state's Medicaid agency. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Patricia Henke, who's the director of the Colorado Office of Employment First, which is housed at the Colorado uh, University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. So with no further ado, I will pass it along to Megan. Thank you, Lisa. Colorado is really excited and thankful to be here to share about braiding, blending, and sequencing work and the successes that Colorado has had. Um, next slide, please. 
As John F. Kennedy once said, partnerships is, is not a posture, but a process, a continuous process that grows stronger each year as we devote ourselves to common tasks. This quote rings true for what we have been able to accomplish in our state, and it would not have been possible without the strong partnerships and tireless efforts of advocates, our state rehabilitation council, stakeholders, people with disabilities themselves and their families, and our state agencies like DVR, Medicaid, Department of Education, the Colorado Office of Employment First, and the Office of Behavioral Health, to name only a few. Actively working together on employment first efforts and partnering to improve processes to incorporate braiding and sequencing of services to job seekers continues to strengthen these partnerships and the work that we do each year. Next slide, please. So with these developed and strong partnerships I just mentioned in our state, we have been able to leverage resources together to meet the needs of job seekers. Colorado has updated our eligibility processes to collaborate more fully to ensure rapid engagement to services. We have created a sequencing of services process between DVR and Medicaid, which we will go into more detail here in a minute. Colorado has ongoing cross-agency collaboration and discussions to determine first payer of services and when those services can be provided so that we are able to more fully braid and sequence services for job seekers. We have also identified liaisons and direct referral contacts at the local level between agencies to simplify referral processes and create a more streamlined quick access to our services. We actively collaborate and partner together regarding training to all stakeholders, which assists with modeling collaboration and giving blessing for braiding and sequencing. We also focus heavily on school to work services and reaching people younger to raise expectations for employment. Partners and stakeholders have worked hard to leverage resources to create a tool for all entities to utilize to fully support and set students up for employment success with skills, experiences, and needed support in our developed education sequencing of services processes. So with the next slide, I'll go over with you the work uh, that these partnerships have also yielded with overall program successes in Colorado. In 2021, the Disability Benefits 101 website was launched to support dispelling myths about benefits and work and to help with benefits planning when job seekers are going to work. This initiative was led by the Colorado Office of Employment First and funded in part by DVR and through legislative efforts in partnership with our DD Council. It was also supported by longtime advocacy from our disability community. Customized employment and individual placement and supports is evidence-based practices that we have service provision expanded throughout collabor through our collaborative efforts, yielding more providers being trained to adequately support job seekers using these techniques. A disability program navigator pilot with local workforce centers began with leadership and partnership between Eric Clark with DVR and Robin Bachnick from Colorado Department of Labor and Employment, among others, in 2022 to support individuals with disabilities working with workforce centers to achieve their employment goals. A Medicaid incentive-based payment pilot began in 2020 and was led by Colorado Medicaid, who proactively partners with DVR and stakeholders. This pilot aims to restructure rates providing incentive-based payments instead of fee-for-service for the quality outcomes in competitive integrated employment. And also, a large focus for Colorado has been the overarching Employment First community and movement, where all of our partners are actively collaborating, being truly invested in achieving real work for real pay for all Coloradoans. Now, I'm going to hand it over to Katie Tolerchio to discuss some formal agreements. Thank you, Megan. In the next slide, please. I just wanna say thanks to everybody. It's a true honor to be here to tell the story of Colorado and learn from other states as well, so thank you. And Megan hit on a lot of stuff that's happening here in Colorado in a broad way. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more narrow about some of our partnering and formal agreements that we have in place. And these are gonna be mainly between the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation and Healthcare Policy and Financing, which is the Colorado Medicaid working with the home and community-based waivers. And we have a memorandum of understanding in place and we will be able to link to anybody, if anybody's interested, you'll be able to see the memorandum of understanding. And the neat thing is this formal agreement 
creates a, an umbrella that highlights the three things noted on this slide. And one of them is that we want to make sure there are employment leads in each of our systems to make sure we know each other's language, this, how, how things work, how, how do you, you know, become eligible and what are some of the nuances there. And that's at a state level, but then it also goes into the local level where people are uh, leads in the case management side and leads in the DVR counselor side and just really helps people coordinate and get to know, you know, the whole system and becomes go-to people so that when somebody on a waiver is talking to DVR, it's not a whole new concept and we can figure out how to support that person where they are to um, experience seamless services. Another thing is we're always trying to develop statewide best practices. And a really cool thing about this is we're learning from the communities. We get to learn from local communities about how things are going. And then sometimes a, a really rural area can suggest something that works across the state to make things um, more seamless. And another thing that we really love doing, and again, it, that, that broader structure of a um, formal agreement helps us do this, but we provide training and guidance together. So we come into communities with DVR counselors and Medicaid case managers to say, how are things going? What's not working and what can we you know, fix? Uh, and the neat thing is that that can be done in real time. We can oftentimes have this umbrella and have the formal things going, but then depending on what the community needs, we can adjust accordingly. So those are some of the formal things we have in place. And next I'm gonna talk about our, um, thank you, our, our sequencing and breeding of services. So we have a visual slide here where we wanna tell the story about a job seeker and how they move through the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation and the Medicaid waivers. The top of the slide says collaboration and braiding of funding, and it's the first slide of two. And then on the bottom of the slide on the left-hand side is three different stick figures that represent different elements on the slide. The first is the um, stick figure of the job seeker, that's a black color. And then there's the um, representation for Medicaid, which is the green color, and the representation for the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, which is the blue color. And I'm going to start right in the middle of the slide where that line begins, and it goes right across. So it's it's showing the whole line that somebody's going to be on their road to getting uh, on their way to getting a job. And first, you see the job seeker there, and they say, "I want a job." And then the very first thing that you see on the left hand side to start moving towards the right is that there's a referral made to the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. And once that referral is made, that opens up the door to Medicaid being able to come in. So what happens next is you see the two people, the job seeker with the Medicaid representation and Medicaid as the eligibility and application are happening with DVR, Medicaid can start in those early engagement processes and those um, early parts of getting a job. Who, who's the job seeker? What are they good at? How do they wanna represent themselves? Who, where are the places that they wanna work? Get started with all of that. Um, and then I'm, we're gonna, model some of our partnership here and Megan Green with DVR is going to take the next two steps. Yeah, thanks Katie. So at um, this point in time, um, sorry, back one slide real quick. Um, at this point in time in the process after a referral is made to DVR um, and you know the initial steps that Katie described have started, um, DVR can open a case with the job seeker and begin job development. If the individual um, completed or is in process of completing the customized employment discovery, the DVR counselor will review and approve that completed profile. This is represented on the slide here as um, the black and blue stick figure there. Um, but it's a little misleading in that it can be just um, DVR services and the job seeker, but also uh, the collaboration partnership remains when DVR is open and actively serving um, that individual with their employment goals. This allows for discussion on braiding of any needed services that our Medicaid partners can support with uh, at that time, in addition to the sequence process. Um, and they can support with services alongside those DVR services for employment goals. From there, uh, DVR initial job coaching and systematic instruction begins. When a job seeker is hired, DVR can provide job coaching and or systematic instruction to support the employed individual in becoming stable in this placement. Once stability is achieved, as agreed upon by all partners and most importantly, the employed in individual, services can be transferred or sequenced back to the Medicaid agency for long-term support. 
any braided services or services that Medicaid were supporting all along the way can continue to be provided during this time as a long-term support as well by Medicaid as appropriate. And now I'm gonna sequence the speaking back to Katie. Thanks, Megan. Now we're ready for the next slide. Okay, here starting again on the left-hand side is a um, big talk bubble. And at this point, the person is working in their new job and that's super exciting. And they're still getting support from DVR uh, as Megan talked about um, learning how to do the job, learning how to do the tasks on the job. But they also need, and they're saying this in their talk bubble, I need personal assistance in employment. And that can mean a whole bunch of things. Um, you know, it, may, it might mean that they need some physical support to make sure they have the tools and how to get the job done. It might mean that they have a health condition that requires somebody to be around all the time. It might mean that they made some bad decisions in their history and um, for that have the support level where somebody needs to be there all the time. And so in this part of the journey, the Medicaid is paying for that personal assistance while DVR is still paying for it, the job coaching. And this is a great example of braiding like Lisa talked about, we kind of went from that relay into the team sport at this stage. Uh, and then this slide continues on to show that the, the person that's working is um, to a point where DVR, like Megan said, is good. They know their job. They, you know, it seems that the person themselves doesn't need support and DVR feels like that's the truth. And that might be the end of their funding or if they still need some supports for different reasons, they can have more job coaching and we often, refer to that as extended job coaching or learning tasks or different things. And that's a quick snapshot of um, some of our sequencing and braiding in Colorado with Medi Medicaid and Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. And I'm gonna now um, pass it over to Patricia Hankey to talk about lessons learned in Colorado. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, so I'm gonna share some of the many lessons um, <laughs> that Colorado team has learned that has helped frame our ever evolving work in supporting individuals to reach their employment goals. Um, the first one is really just meeting the person where they are and using a person-centered approach in their employment journey. It's important for us in Colorado to always take a step back and think about individualized services and critical relationships that must be built to support an individual. Colorado has also learned that providing proactive encouragement and empowerment of staff at all levels between our state Medicaid agency and the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation around the topic of payer of last resort is really important. Um, and so the Colorado team models collaboration and frequent communication between agencies at the administrative levels and genuinely engage field staff, ser service provider organizations, community partners, and advocacy organizations to support processes to move forward at the local level. Colorado has also come to understand that administrators want to roll their sleeves up and, and get involved and help problem solve. And so modeling availability and having open door discussions for staff at all levels creates that collaborative environment needed to support this work. And another lesson, which we know um, many of you are familiar with, it, and, and we are highly focused on, is really starting to instill expectations of competitive integrated employment at an early age with the people we serve and their families. And for these conversations to occur frequent, frequently, we know that with the right strategies, the right partnerships, and the right person-centered supports that all individuals are capable of competitive integrated employment. Next slide, please. So we'd like to introduce you to Jess. Jess is pictured here with his supervisor at Cosmos Pizza where he works. And if you're ever in Colorado and like pizza, Cosmos is the place to go. Um, it's, an, it's kind of a, a famous place in Colorado to get pizza. Um, Jess obtained this job while participating in Colorado's customized employment pilot, where he received services using the braided funding approach that Katie and Megan described. Um, Jess and his supervisor in this picture are facing each other smiling, and you might notice they are not wearing masks, as it was before the pandemic um, that he obtained his employment. But as we move to the next slide, 
you will see that Jess is wearing a mask. Jess's employment journey through a pandemic gives us a great opportunity to think beyond braiding dollars and paid services and recognizing other supports like family, volunteers, natural supports where funds are not exchanged. Jess is fortunate to have very engaged parents. And as Jess was growing up, his family often visited Cosmos Pizza and developed what we might call social capital or getting to know the employees at Cosmos Pizza. Jess um, does have an employment consultant that provides support to him and the employer. And during the pandemic, it was truly a team effort with Jess, his parents, the employment consultant, and the employer to develop and negotiate a plan to ensure Jess's safety while maintaining his employment. Jess continues to enjoy his job, and he shares that he works with really cool people at Cosmos. He gets a paycheck every other week, a free slice of pizza, a free large Diet Coke, and tips every shift which really makes him feel good. And he has learned how to use a bank, spend money on what he likes and has made friends with really cool coworkers. Next slide, please. And so our last slide just shares some of the resources that Katie and Megan were describing um, during their presentation. And so we will have these available for you um, after the webinar, when all the recordings and, and materials go out, um, where you see EFAP, EFAP, that's the Employment First Advisory Partnership in Colorado. And so we have an MOU, a strategic plan, the bylaws, the goals, vision, lots of information about what happens with our Employment First Advisory Partnership. And then again, um, Katie had mentioned the MOU between Medicaid and DVR and also the flowchart. Um, and so that concludes the Colorado portion of the presentation, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Lisa Mills. Thank you. Thank you to the Colorado team. And because we have a minute or two, I'd like to just pose one question to you, getting in the weeds around your wonderful example of braiding. Um, if a person with a disability is at the point where they are stable in their employment, they have moved into receiving extended job coaching from the Medicaid system, uh, and, and they have a need for benefits counseling, and maybe they get a wage increase, or they get an offer of more hours or a promotion, um, can they come back to DVR and would DVR open their case again while they are working with supports from Medicaid? Thanks, Lisa. I'll take that question. And yes, absolutely. That is something that we are happy to provide services around benefits planning to ensure that people are able to advance or retain their employment if there are changes in, in wages related to benefits planning supporting that. Great. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's a question that often comes up as we as we aim for equity and inclusion. Uh, we want people to be able to earn more um, and move up in their careers as they proceed. So thanks for, for clarifying that. I am now pleased to move on to introduce the North Carolina panel. Today we have Kathy Trotter, who's the division director at the North Carolina uh, Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Services. We have Alice Farrar, who is Chief of Employment Services and Program Development, also at the North Carolina Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Services. And we have Sam Hedrick, who is an attorney and senior advisor on the Americans with Disabilities Act at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, uh, leading the initiative that coordinates all state agencies around transitions to community living, which includes uh, gainful employment. So I will turn it over to Kathy, take it away. Kathy, you may need to yes. unmute. Here I am. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, we are so glad to be here today. Um, can you advance to the next slide, please? Uh, I'm here to tell you today, and it's, it's my pleasure to do so, about North Carolina's combined efforts to support the success of those 
with severe and persistent mental illness. Um, this is an area that we know that we all uh, that are in vocational rehabilitation and mental health services all um, have worked hard and have struggled at some times to assure that we're providing helpful and effective services uh, to these clients. And we've um, worked together and found some ways that we can sequence our funding and combine our efforts and our ideas uh, to really be effective uh, with this uh, group that in the past has faced so many barriers when it comes to competitive integrated employment. Um, through what the IPS program or Individual Placement and Support Program, Individuals are offered personalized counseling to understand how work can affect them and their benefits. They receive ongoing treatment to help manage any medications, manage their symptoms, and to address any behavioral health needs that are ongoing. But they also receive help and assistance from employment specialists, from peer support, uh, to help make sure that they are successful throughout the process from beginning to throughout their um, employment. Uh, so we're here to share with you today um, how we've been able to work together uh, through DVRS as well as through our mental health partners uh, to come together to provide effective services for our community. Sam, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Kathy. Next slide, please. Uh, as a result of the settlement agreement with the U.S. Department of Justice around persons with serious and persistent mental illness, North Carolina developed a permanent supported housing model um, that would give people the needed support they needed that, that was going to be needed for them to be successful in the community. It begins with housing, of course. Um, we do provide rental subsidies and uh, everyone gets tenancy support. Uh, and we also provide mental health services and those are needs-based and recovery oriented. Um, I'll come back to supported employment in a moment. We, we, in addition, we have discharge and planning and transition planning guidelines that are very specific to persons um, coming out of institutions. We also have a pre-admission screening and diversion process for people who um, are at risk of entering an institution. With that, we have also um, we we also have a quality assurance and metric system that we believe will demonstrate uh, uh, more effectively the importance of all of these pieces. But the ultimate outcome is community integration. And we believe one of the most important elements of this framework for change is the IPS um, service. Um, we, and we also believe that uh, the partnerships that we have formed around the braided funding have really helped to increase access to persons with serious and persistent mental illness to uh, employment and education opportunities. And we, we also believe that it has uh, created new kinds of opportunities for us to partner with, with people such as uh, the Centers for Independent Living who helped us to make sure people get the word about employment opportunities through IPS. Next slide, please. Hey, Sam, could, yes. could I ask you just to tilt your camera down a little so we can see you better? There we go, a little further. Is that better? I, I can't see me uh, myself, so it's hard to know. Yeah, that's great. Now. All right, good. So, hey everyone, I'm Alice from North Carolina and want to talk just for a few minutes about um, our sequential funding project to, that we have with IPS. On the screen, you'll see a kind of a flow chart of arrows about um, the order in which we go through. So we've established a value-based sequential purchasing model for IPS known as NC Core, the North Carolina Collaborative for Ongoing Recovery Through Employment. And this funding model touches about 50% of our state. When IPS was initially introduced in North Carolina, the service was heavily dependent on state and Medicaid funds. 
in as our as partnerships increased with VR, we began to discuss the benefits of sequential funding, um, which would allow VR to contribute to the overall cost of the service. Uh, and our state and Medicaid dollars could be stretched a little bit further. When we fully share in the cost of the service, VR contributes just over $8,000 to the cost of the service, and not to mention all the vocational expertise that we bring to the team. What we've noticed is that this shared funding has allowed teams to operate at a profit. They've been able to add staff and the savings to our um, LMEMCOs have allowed for providers to be expanded and they were able to offer some stabilizing payments um, during the um, initial parts of the um, pandemic. I wanna take just a few minutes to look at the sequential funding established in North Carolina. The blue milestones are funded through state or Medicaid dollars, and the orange are VR funds. The first milestone is engagement. It's an outreach milestone in which the IPS team really talks to an, in, an individual about IPS and gains their interest in pursuing employment. For our targeted population, it's likely to take several visits for an individual to express interest in pursuing competitive integrated employment. So we allow that milestone to be earned multiple times. Once interest is expressed, a career profile is developed and milestone two is paid out. Moving on to milestone three, job development with retention. This is a VR funded milestone and we can pay this multiple times as we understand that if an individual may not have worked um, in many years, it might take a few jobs to figure out the best setting. Moving on sequentially, job supports are initiated after an individual has obtained employment. And again, if it's taking a couple of jobs to find the right fit, we wanna support individuals on those jobs. So this milestone can also be paid multiple times. Once there's independence that's been achieved at work, VR begins the 90 day count. And once achieved, um, we have a 90 day successful employment payment. Funding doesn't end here though. Next slide, slide please. We move on to um, another milestone payment funded by state or Medicaid dollars of 210 days employment. And finally, there's a milestone for vocational advancement, which includes pursuing further education for career advancement or assisting an individual with the promotion. Each milestone has specific documentation required for approval. And those that last milestone, 7A or 7B, can be um, applied at any point during the continuum of uh, milestone services. Lastly, we're encouraging our LME MCOs to establish incentives for referral sources to ensure we're serving the targeted population. Um, this is still under construction in North Carolina, but we're making great progress in that. Um, so looking forward to seeing where that lands and how it impacts the population that we hope to serve. I am going to kick it back to Sam for a little bit more detail on North Carolina's investment in our Transition to Community Living Initiative. Thank you, Alice. Next slide, please. We wanted to share with you some of the investment that the state has made outside of Medicaid to ensure that persons with serious persistent mental illness that are eligible to, for Transition to Community Living are successful. You'll notice that in housing, we have grown that rental subsidy budgeted by almost 25%, and we are at $40 million each year that we, we help someone um, to uh, pay their rental um, housing unit. We have, in, we have uh, $5 million in mental health supports out in addition to uh, Medicaid services. We have uh, almost 4 million in IPS employment uh, for state funded as well. We have invested in quality metrics um, over the last couple of years. And we, this is the staffing that is uh, so important um, in the whole framework of 
community integration. That, that is transition coordinators across the state who help a person transition successfully from an institution into the community. And also in reach, which generally are peers who help to educate people about their community options and guide them through that journey uh, from, from um, post pre-tenancy to post-tenancy. And lastly, community integration is the project where I, that I mentioned with our Centers for Independent Living who help us to engage with people while they're in housing to make sure that their needs are met, that they have access to services and supports and they're pointed towards IPS um, when someone says, yes, uh, I would really like to hear more about employment and education. So our total state investment has, has grown this past year 20% and we expect that to climb each year, particularly with the increase of rental costs across the nation. Next slide, please. And of course here, the collaboration is, is key. We, as we, as I mentioned, this was all a part of a settlement agreement that we entered with the United States Department of Justice in 2012. And the purpose was to make sure that people uh, with SPMI were living in and had access to the least restrictive settings and the supports they needed to be successful. Um, we have provided a link to our settlement agreement here. And I believe, um, the, next slide, please. And we have uh, also created, developed data use agreements and memorandums of agreement between the Department of Health and Human Services, BR, uh, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, Health Benefits, which is our Medicaid partner, and also the Division of Mental Health. And I will pass it back to, to Kathy, I believe. Thank you. Um, actually, it's me, Sam, so I'll take it from here. Thank you. Um, so next slide, please. We have learned a tremendous amount in North Carolina with our transition to sequential funding. First, all stakeholders need to know each other's goals, processes, and language. We have to all recognize our common goal of competitive integrated employment or CIE, um, despite differences on how we get there. We have noticed a tremendous shift in the VR team's understanding of employment as treatment, as a treatment rather than an end goal. And this culture shift along with the sequential funding has been a turning point in the state for our implementation of IPS and is vital to our success to date. Finally, we find a lot of value in celebrating the small successes along the way. It, it really helps keep us moving forward. So with that, let me tell you about John. Next slide, please. So John is a 55-year-old gentleman with schizophrenia, undiagnosed for many years. Once diagnosed, he struggled with finding the correct combination of medication. Then there were some struggles with medication noncompliance some hospitalizations, homelessness, criminal charges, and of course, unemployment. I'm certain you have very similar, have seen very similar cycles in some of your clients. Next slide, please. When John met with his psychiatrist at RHA Health Services, he learned about a new approach to services known as IPS. Next slide. During a joint intake with his employment specialist and VR counselor, John answered questions and shared typical intake information. The nice thing is he only told his story one time. The employment specialist and VR counselor worked together on resume development, interviewing strategy, and other vital steps necessary to obtain employment. John worked with his RHA peer support specialist to explore housing, and was successful in finding independent housing in the community. Next slide, please. After finishing up some coursework, John began an active job search with the help of the employment uh, specialist and the VR team. 
John did have a lot of interviews, but no job. We all know it happens, but gosh, when were we gonna get there? Well, with the right team support, uh, they were met with success. John secured employment as a monitor two to three nights a week. He's very happy in his position now, and it's given him some confidence to think about his next career goal. Next slide, please. John's story is an example of the system supporting John where he was and allowing employment to provide him with purpose, structure, and confidence to think about what's next. The strong collaboration between all the team members, including John, are the driving force behind this success. Lisa, back to you. Thank you very much. Appreciate the North Carolina team and such a great presentation and really emphasizing the importance of the connection between employment and housing. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody on the webinar that if you have questions for the presenters, please put it in the Q&A uh, rather than into the chat section. Um, and if you can, if you have a, you want to direct a question to a particular state panel or a particular presenter, please note that when you enter the question in the Q&A. Uh, I am pleased now, next slide, to introduce our last but not least panel uh, from the state of Arizona. We have Dr. Wendy Parent Johnson, who's the executive director of the Sonoran Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities um, at the University of Arizona. We also have with her Kristen Mackey, who is the Administrator for the Arizona Rehabilitation Services Administration, otherwise known as Arizona VR. And we have Narissa Birdsell from the Babaku Kavari Unified School District, and I will say I practiced that many times, but I think I still did not get it right. So I will rely on Narissa to help us with that. Um, so we have a wonderful local team here to tell a story of local collaboration around youth and transition. So take it away, Wendy. Thank you, Lisa. I'm so excited to be here with our Arizona team and share how we build our partnership and braided funds uh, at the local level. Next slide, please. So just to give you an idea of getting started here, the Sonoran Center, um, as, as Lisa mentioned, we're a university center for excellence in developmental disabilities, which is one of 67 centers funded by the administration on um, intellectual and developmental disabilities with um, ACL, Administration on Community Living. And we there's 67 located in all the states and, and territories. And we're all focused on promoting full participation of people with disabilities in all aspects of their community. When we started out, I had just taken over this role three years ago. I moved to Arizona and moved into this position. And there was a, a new diversity partnership implementation grant funded by the Administration on Community Living, which is where we got started. And we were building a disability resource center together with the Tohono O'odham Community College. When, we, when I met with them and we started talking and asked, what is it, your greatest need here? It was building a pipeline from the high school to the college. So that's triggered starting those relationships and making those connections across the state, which may be very similar to some of you who are just building your partnerships and starting out with those new relationships. Next slide, please. So I've listed out strategies that we used and found very helpful in building our partnership. And there's an illustration on the right with five bowls where it, there's liquid pouring out of each one. And if you see that each one gets bigger and bigger and more full as it goes. And that's what has happened as a result of our partnership. So I'm going to highlight a few of the points that really um, stand out and I think are so important for us thinking about getting started. And that is someone take the lead. There has to be a beginning, someone to bring all these entities together, which may already exist and may, people may be working separately. So bringing them together and keeping people connected and moving forward 
um, we had regular meetings scheduled that we kept in touch, even if we didn't have an agenda or anything to meet about. And then having a local liaison or champion, if, we, if you're scattered around the state as we are, then having that person at the local level, as Ms. Birdsell um, was and is going to share more about that, is, is such a, a helpful way to stay connected. And then getting started, you know, we didn't have resources to begin this, but one of the needs was bring expanding services and employment outcomes. So we brainstormed, what can we do? And we brought, um, this was pre-COVID now, we brought um, virtual speakers of different careers, as well as um, virtual job tours to the students in the class to get started and begin things as we started bringing in more resources to add to what um, the work we were doing. Next slide, please. And so the USAG can be in a great role to do these things because they cross over so many entities and we all dedicated the additional staff resources to assist with making things happen. I think an important point to think about is not get caught up in this is the way we always do it or this is the status quo because let's think about it differently. So whenever we had a problem, we were thinking, what can we do? And we'd present an idea, think about a pilot, share what could be possible, and you'll be surprised. The other partners will all you jump on and we make things happen. And then have an outcome, even if it's very small, and share those successes. Well, there's a resource at the end that we call work-based work learning resume that we found to be really helpful to share with all of the different partners um, around each individual uh, person's situation with employment and work experience, but then also through social media and other channels, because as people hear not only the story, but the journey, then they start getting on board and more and more people follow. Um, next slide, please. And I am going to turn it over to Kristen. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, yeah, so, you know, as Wendy, Wendy said, I mean, she was relatively new in the position. I was relatively new in my position. You know, WIOA says you have to spend so much money on your potentially eligible students beginning at the age of 14 statewide. And we kind of got together and they said, I've got a gap in state VR. I don't have the, you know, I don't have the staff to be able to meet all of those needs, um, and especially knowing that we were not meeting our tribal um, and rural populations, the, the, the work there. Um, we also talked a lot about, we don't wanna just provide the service. We wanna build capacity across the state in order to have this uh, service continue to happen after we're gone, um, or after, you know, if somebody moves, that, that there is a toolbox still there. So how can we build the capacity? And we really did ask that question, what's possible? What's allowable? Um, so we looked at our current ex existing agreements. We have several interagency agreements. We have an, an employment first agreement. We work together to help bring uh, the various stakeholders across the state together. Uh, we work together on project search opportunities. Didn't quite fit into either of those really nicely. So we developed a new agreement um, to specifically serve pre-ets and transition services. Um, and then we uh, additionally, you know, the state VR had uh, has an MOU with the tribal VR. So it said, you know, hey, we've got all all of these entities together, how can we leverage each other's funding and staff to be able to provide the services across the state that we need? So I kick it back over to, uh, I think it's near you to next. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, next slide, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my part in this presentation with Arizona team is to share our school success in uh, our great collaboration and partnership with var various state, tribal, and local agencies. Uh, I'm the transition specialist at Babakibi Unified School District. We are a public school located in the Tohana Atam Reservation. We are about 20 miles um, in the Mexico border. And I think we have over about 33,000 um, tribal members in the, in the nation. So our transition program is anchored in two things. First is a framework of actionable plans um, with, uh, with focus on priority areas, which I'm gonna um, 
I'll tell you later on. And the second is sustained partnership through ongoing planning and activities. So our um, priority areas in our transition programs are educational structure and monitoring, interagency collaboration, student involvement and development, and family involvement. Under our educational structure, we started out with designing and developing our transition action plan. And we have so many activities going on uh, from the time that we started uh, improving our transition services. So we partnered with our, um, our Arizona Department of Education and University of Kansas in var various programs. We um, completed our program with, the, uh, with them in creating our assessment toolkit, which is very important in transition planning for our students. And also through our partnership with Sonora and USED, we provided a lot of training and workshops for our students. We had virtual presentations, like when we just mentioned earlier that uh, through COVID, we are 100% virtual the whole school year, but we were still able to provide all those opportunities for students to um, listen to different speakers from different businesses and career fields. And in 2014, I conducted a study um, about interagency collaboration and transition outcomes um, through inter interagency collaboration in our community. And based on that study, I identified the different um, barriers in inter effect effective interagency collaboration. And that's what we focus on. I know that it was very difficult for us in our being in the um, in the district, in the community, to make this connection, finding ways on how to fund our transition program. But currently, if you will see on our slides under interagency collaboration, we have different agencies, we have different partners in all our transition programs. We have our school district, we have Sonora and USED, our communica community college that is located in our um, um, nation, we have the state um, VR, uh, Division of Developmental Disabilities, our tribal VR, One Stop and Special Needs Division, who are also our partners in providing services for students. Next slide, please. And the other priority areas that we, um, that we focus on is student involvement and development. This is when all of this wonderful good stuff are happening through our partnerships and collaboration with different agencies our students were able to participate in different workshops virtual work-based learning and also i think the past two years we we've been um participating in the transition ahead ahead roundtable sessions through a uh, sonora new set which is similar to the person-centered planning and also we have some graduate students who are participating in work adjustment program through tri tribal VR. And um, we have so many students also who are uh, registered in pre-employment transition services through the, the state VR. And on our own district, we developed and created our own cloud, which we call uh, Project YES. YES stands for Youth Empowered to Succeed. And through this project, we provide our students opportunities for um, experiences and volunteer work within our school district. And the last area that we focus on, which is very important, is family involvement. I know that our, our parents and our family members attend and participate in our meetings, but this year, I think we started last year too, that they participated in Transition Ahead Roundtable Forum, wherein they're able to share their own experiences um, on how to plan alongside their, their children and, or their child at home. And another one that we, we have plans that hopefully in the future when, you know, group gatherings is uh, less restrictive uh, because of this COVID, hopefully we'll be able to pro provide our family and parents and students um, some time to get together through our transition and parent night. So transition really is a team effort and we are stronger together. And like today, um, one of our graduates from our high school is here to share his success story. Um, three years ago or three school years ago, he was our student and now he's my coworker. So take it away, Clayton. 
Next slide, please. Good afternoon. My name is Clayton Poncho. Um, I'm a, a graduate from here, Bowtie River Unified School District. I was the class of 2019. Throughout my success here with the program was what I call a collaboration with not just one resource. It was multiple resources I used, I utilized, and um, with uh, Ms. Birdsell, my assistant, at, well, she was assisting me on directions on where to go and where to look. And I did work with Wendy a few times, you know, meeting through the, the sessions that she mentioned. And I really participated, you know, getting the information that I needed into the point where I'm at now. So Clayton, do you want the next slide now? Uh, yes, please. Okay. So do you want to tell us about how, what you did in high school and how that helped prepare you for your job now? Yes. So my sophomore year, you know, there's a, that's a summer youth program, which is within my community that I was involved in. You know, the summer youth program is every summer I apply. And my first year I was working at a grocery store named Bashes and I got to work with everybody there. I was uh, dual enrollment with TOCC, the Thornton Community College. And I was referred to the transition program and I did the group intake. And, and you know, with every program, which was, that helped me was the high school, the tribal, VR, the state, and the, the college and the university. And I graduated the class of 2019. And then I attended my first semester at TOCC, which it was awesome. Then COVID-19, when that impacted, you know, I was still there at Bashes. You know, I was doing what I was doing. My position at Bashes was courtesy clerk. So what that means is I will be, you know, bagging groceries, going from one area to another and uh, doing multiple tasks at once. But when COVID-19 hit, it kind of infected the nation very hard. And so I had responsibilities at home. So I had to resign due to the situations that I was in. I resigned and I was taking care of my parent, grandparents and I got nieces and nephews at the time, so I didn't want to risk them getting sick and me being exposed and exposing them. So that's when I resigned. And I believe as of six months now, maybe soon to be six months, I've been working here at the transportation for the school district. I'm a full-time employee. employee. What I do, I'm a, my position is bus aide. I, what I do is sit on the bus, monitor the students. As, as we know that the masks are mandated still here on the nation and just having a conversation with them, you know, what I do, what are my, my um, education in college, what I was going for was social work. I love working with children, so, you know, the job that I have, I love what I do, what I do, you know, interact with students. And since this nation is kind of a whole community base that, you know, everybody knows me. I know them, I know their grandparents, so I'm seeing those kids every morning, every afternoon, brings a smile to my face, even though you can't see it while I'm wearing my mask, but I know that they impacted their lives and it's what I do. So one of the things, Clayton, I, that you shared that I think is so important for everyone to hear is what you mentioned last at the bottom there about what what um, all of these people that are supporting you now. Um, can you, do you want to explain that? What is important? Collaboration? Well, you know, with all these collaborations that I have with, with mm -hmm. these different programs, it's not where I just choose one program and Specifically, and you know, I whatever program that are willing to work with me, I was I was on it. And, you know, I would go to them. I would go to the tribal VR. I think it'll be a, 
multiple occasions, I'll go and ask questions and, you know, especially during college, you know, I had I've, one of my professors say, well, talk to him one-on-one -on -one and get the help that I needed. Um, so Clayton, thank you so much for sharing your story and, and you just, um, so, so such good information for others to think about. Mm -hmm. um, so you can add more as we go, if you'd like. Next slide, please. So one of the things as we look at our partnership and implementing to provide services, even though we had a strong partnership, it did not take away from those very real challenges that exist when implementation occurs. And so on the left are some of the challenges that we all experience. And just to highlight a few, thinking about geography and distance and, and rural transportation. And so um, one of the things that we did here before COVID, we were focusing on some virtual supports. And so um, after COVID, we thought, well, how do we push this further? And so we did rural job development and we did rural work-based learning and rural um, summer work experiences where students participated and they had uh, support from um, virtually through a job coach. And so all of these were done virtually. And the funding on the right is how we combine to address these challenges on the left. And one of the things I wanna stress is every one of these entities, dedicated staff, whether there was funding or not, to jump in where there was a difficult um, problem to solve to try and figure out ways to do it. And we collaborated to problem solve together. Uh, for example, technology access having people um, be able to have more than one computer to share, having Wi-Fi, having a camera. And so we would look at into each individual person. We bought hotspots and we sent them. We had people go to different locations where they could access. We worked schedules around when they could have use of a computer or sending them a camera to be able to participate and then teaching them to be able to do that. So we looked at the problem solving and used our resources to be able to come together to make these things happen. And those are just a few examples. Uh, the staff shortages is one we constantly come up with and we're always texting or on the phone addressing with each other, how can we make this work? And often it's a short-term solution while we're working out the long-term solution. Um, next slide, please. Kristen. Thank you. So this is, you know, we've heard it mentioned before throughout this webinar, competitive integrated employment is everybody's goal. And so, you know, how do we find the funding pathway? Um, really wanted to make an attempt to have, there's multiple pathways to the shared goal. And so um, it's less about whose dollar started when and where and how. It was kind of that no wrong door. If somebody came in and said, there's a service need, uh, we had, um, generally speaking, Sonora and you said, staff would be the ones, you know, would get that kind of initial call to action. And then we start to tap in VR, you know, state VR, uh, tribal VR, the school district, the community college, where is that person going to be supported the best? And so um, that is in general, the conversations and how the, the services are coordinated around the different partner agencies. Uh, we, we had, I mentioned before, we had a gap on work-based learning from a VR perspective for pre -ed. So, you know, how can we help build those services? And then we're finding we provide the work-based learning Learning service, and we're getting employment outcomes um, after work-based learning, summer work. You know, we're getting folks in, now involved and interested in exploring VR more. So then we open a VR case. You know, so there's just a lot of opportunities. But having that kind of that central focus around how do we support the individual in um, gaining the skills they need to have that competitive integrated employment at the outcome, and then those post-job supports. Uh, so you know, and again. Again, Wendy said, we have state VR dollars, we have pre ads dollars, we have USED dollars, you know, across different administrations, Department of Ed, you know, Administration for Community Living, the school districts. Um, it's just really uh, less about how are we going to pay for this? Everybody's jumping in and saying, how can we get to yes to support this individual to the desired outcome that is our shared goal? 
So next slide. Okay, thank you, um, Kristen. And you know, when we look at some of the um, lessons learned, I think one of the uh, most important is to operate from uh, a framework, we can do this. You know, it forces us then to look at solutions and, and to look beyond the challenge that we're experiencing. Also, take time to develop the relationships with and don't have an ask. I think this is one of the most important investments up front and the, one of the hardest things to keep doing when you don't have a specific agenda or you're not asking for something, but just spending that time together and getting to know each other and working together. Um, and also, I think being flexible while you're going together down this road, there's going to be bumps and there's going to be curves. Things are going to change, emerging issues are going to um, come and also additional opportunities. So think about this as an organic process. It's going to grow and evolve over time and to go with that. And, and it's also an iterative, iterative, iterative process, sorry. Um, so thinking about incorporating the feedback. So you're building a responsive service and system to address the, the, the people that are participating and benefiting from the services, as well as all of the partners that are involved. So with that, Lisa, I will turn it over to you and thank you. Thank you very much to the Arizona team. And it's great to hear the emphasis on no wrong door and uh, how a, a really strong partnership with everyone willing to come to the table can create a situation where there really truly is no wrong door. Uh, I'd like to thank, thank you again and thank you Clayton for taking time off of work to be with us here um, and uh, good luck on your career path as you go forward. I'd like to turn it back now to Vince Kohler for the question and answer session. Thank you, Lisa, and thanks to all the panelists and presenters, uh, including for sticking to the timeline, which allows us now to have quite a bit of time for questions and answers. And thank you all for participating and giving us a lot of questions to work with. There are many more than we will be able to get to, um, but I also realize, and you may have realized that many of the questions have already been uh, answered or, or started to being answered uh, in, in, in writing. So keep an eye on that Q&A box. Uh, I may ask a question here or there that's already been answered in part because other states may have slightly different answers. Um, one uh, question, uh, let me start off with one for the North Carolina team. Um, uh, it sounds, it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable uh, is the question that the providers are generating profits and services are expanding. So the question is, has North Carolina run into challenges that other states have faced with regard to difficulty in maintaining DSPs in the field? And if not, what were your strategies for avoiding that? So this goes to North Carolina. Others may have uh, something to weigh in as well. Who wants yes. to take that in North Carolina? Yes, thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. So we have seen this, um, the, um, the good work that we reported in, not, that has not been a statewide phenomenon. We too um, in North Carolina experienced uh, the direct support professional shortage as um, I'm sure it's in every corner of our, of our nation. Um, in this particular instance, um, it was the provider was able to operate in the black with their um, IPS services, and they were able to maintain their staff and add um, add an, another employment specialist. Um, that's not to say that we don't have turnover on um, many of our IPS teams and our other employment providers have a lot of turnover. Anyone else want to weigh in on that one particularly? Yep, we certainly don't have the magic bullet here in North Carolina. We'd love it though. Well, it sounds sounds pretty close to it. Uh, question for Colorado and North Carolina. How do pre-ETS dollars get used with these models? Who wants to go first? How about we hand this off to Colorado first? Take that one. Um, so our pre-employment transition services dollars, we, and I put this in uh, the Q&A chat if anyone um, wants to look at the resource listed, 
Um, but we've developed a specific sequencing of services tool for students and youth in Colorado with the support of NTACT and many stakeholders and advocate partners, um, led by Cheryl Carver within Colorado DVR and um, Katie Oliver within the Colorado Department of Education, and uh, with support from Jennifer Stewart from the Colorado Office of Employment First. And that really outlines all the different services and support a youth or student um, can really um, have and um, may need to set them up for in their career pathway and goals long term. That outline really facilitates conversations within local interdisciplinary teams, which we are actively supporting those conversations about what that looks like to make sure we're wrapping around um, those students or youth uh, to make sure they're getting those offered to them, provided to them, and encouraging um, all the different providers of all the listed services and, and possible supports uh, to braid services along with that, including DVR and the pre-employment transition services that we can provide throughout that continuum. I don't know. And that link is listed in the answered questions in the Q&A. Um, and I can also put it in the chat as well. Great. That is terrific. Thank you, Megan. Uh, anyone from North Carolina want to weigh in on that? How, how do you handle that? Do you use or how do you use pre-ETS dollars? So I can speak to that. So we um, do um, have a solicitation out there uh, for vendor projects. That's where we have found the most effective use of our pre-employment transition dollars. And um, it is not a prescriptive service, but we um, are very much looking to a local education agency and a provider in our local VR office to determine how they might best work together to provide pre-employment transition services. And from that, there is a, um, a series of milestones that are established um, that um, fund all the required activities of pre -ETS. Great, yeah, good example. Thanks. Um, here's an interesting question um, I, that we hadn't heard before. Have you tracked the number of hours it takes for provider for for the provider to administer the braiding? So, kind of put a cost question on braiding. Does braiding cost money? And have you tracked in any way, shape, or form what those costs might be? Anyone? You know, this is Katie in Colorado. And I forgot to mention one of our success stories, so that might be a good point here. We haven't necessarily tracked the hours, but I just heard this last week, and I meant to mention it during this presentation, that there was somebody that was um, getting support with DVR, and then we came in to support him because he needed some extra support. He had made some bad decisions before and needed somebody around all the time, but he found this excellent job that he loved and he thrived in, and he really just started, his whole life just started going better to the point where he didn't need any um, support anymore. And so I don't know if the braiding didn't happen, if he would have um, been as successful, but uh, so that was that was a neat story where the, the support met him where he was. And then now if he, if he has any, it's like one or two hours a month. Vince, this is Kristen from Arizona. I would say that from a braiding perspective, the dollars, we have to keep track of it anyway. We had to, to, to you know, align the invoices. We had to make sure that, you know, it's allocable in the right spaces. So um, in terms of braiding, I don't know that it's extra administrative cost. The thing that I would just recommend, and we have this built into our agreements, is, is the ability to transfer, is to exchange information. So you just want to be able to exchange that information back and forth, get on a cadence with it. But um, I have not felt like it's been an, an administrative burden, an additional burden, other than what was already necessary for that, that funding source. Great. Yeah. So in other words, the, um, and then there's considerable payoffs. So, so, so in, in, in essence, the cost benefit analysis works in, in, in your favor. Um, we have so many more questions. We have so little time. So I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. We, we please take a look at the Q&A. Um, we're going to keep that open for a little while. And as you've probably observed by now in the chat, there will be um, uh, all of the resources that were shared, including the recording and all of that will be made available. And so I would like for you to, uh, if we could go to the next slide, just alert you where that is. First of all, be sure to check out the LEAD Center's website um, where you can find all that information, very robust library. 
that's all freely available, a newsletter that we encourage you to sign up because it will give you information about both past webinars, future webinars, including you'll be the first one to know when the next webinar on this topic or on related topics on blending and braiding, um, easy for me to say, uh, will come up sometime this summer. It's not quite scheduled yet, but it will happen this summer. And then finally, um, on the last um, slide for us today, uh, feel free to connect with us. If you would please go to the next slide uh, on uh, social media as well. Uh, again, where you will find all the same information and we'd love to connect with you. We wanna thank you so much. Thank the presenter. Uh, the panelists, the and Lisa for facilitating the discussion, um, and uh, take care of yourselves and each other. And uh, and and again, stay tuned for the uh, slides and the recording to come your way if you signed up for this webinar.